Yeah, so the government sure does like to do odd things. And today we're going to take a look at, I think, a little bit of oddity, which are the job reports. So today, uh, this morning, as a matter of fact, uh, there was a couple of different reports that came out and uh, it was a boom for the traditional markets and our markets as well. So at 8.30, we had U.S. non-farm payroll, also unemployment rates, hourly wages, hourly wages over a year. And then we also uh, got to take a look at initial claims. And what this revealed to us, I thought it was quite, it was odd, but interesting. The U.S. non-farm payroll, they expected 150,000. Previously, it was a 159, 159,000. And it jumped up to 254,000 for a monthly jobs growth. Now, when I saw this at first, I'm like, that isn't, that seems like kind of ridiculous because it's just so high. But if you take a look at it over time, going all the way back to 2020, 2021, 22, you can see there's been massive jumps in non-farm payroll. And we can see that even today, as crazy as it is, it's not outside the realm of possibility. However, when you take a look at the jobs uh, where they actually came from, which was <clears throat> the majority was leisure and hospitality, education and health. That's 78,000, 81,000 respectively. But also you take a look at the government jobs, 31,000. It's a lot of jobs for government. And we've seen like, it seems month over month, government just keeps adding jobs and adding jobs. Professional business, 17,000, mining and logging. But there was a reduction in manufacturing and transportation warehousing. Manufacturing you would hope would actually go up because that is good for the GDP, that is good for the economy itself, but there's been a reduction there. But again, as we can see, the uh, jobs have actually picked up. And unemployment, it was expected to actually maintain at 4.2% and it actually dropped to the unemployment rate of 4.1%, which is great. I mean, we were taking a look at the economy, but remember, we just had a rate cut by the Federal Reserve. So you have to ask yourself, who was incorrect here? Because the reason why the Fed cuts rates is because they're thinking to themselves, okay, we need to, we need to do something to kind of stimulate the economy. There is just too much, the, the, the rates are actually too high. We need to stimulate, we need to do something, we need to do something fast. And as they do that, they say, okay, now we're right on track. I don't think that within two to three weeks of whenever they actually did it, which was just last month, I don't think it would lead us to this that quickly. So when I take a look at these jobs reports and these numbers, I'm like something isn't coming together correctly. And I know that there's been a lot of calls for recession. Even myself, I always thought that recession was coming late 2025, maybe 2026. But there's no, it doesn't look like there's anything in the recession or that could be attributed to a recession coming in anytime soon. But you have to remember this also, lastly which is the government will revise these numbers. So it's not like these are set in stone. This is just preliminary reports. But as they come back and go, well, you know what? Maybe we'll revise this a little bit that way or a little bit, a little bit higher, a little bit lower. And sometimes it's actually drastically, especially for jobs growth. So again, when I take a look at this, I'm just wondering myself, is this because of, and of course, not to get political, but there is a presidential election right around the corner. I want to say we have 33 days or so, correct me in the comments section, but... This is actually a very good report for the government. I think the Biden administration or Kamala Harris or whoever's in charge of the United States, I have no idea. Uh, they've actually put this out as praising for Bidenomics and, and, and how well things are going. So this going into the election, like it or not, politics or not, you have to understand this is actually a, a good point for the administration if this actually comes out to fruition. So we have that piece and that's great, um, but also... We took a look at uh, initial claims and those ticked up a little bit. Of course, when you are uh, first uh, have a separation from an employer and you're going to uh, collect unemployment, that will be your initial claims. Went from 219,000, just a little bit high to 225,000. So we have more jobs, but we have more people getting laid off and collecting unemployment. So we'll, so we'll see how it kind of comes together. I'm sure it's going to be just fantastic. So the big question is, it doesn't make much sense. Somebody was wrong here. Either it was the Fed or the numbers themselves. We'll see what happens. But how did the markets respond? Well, pretty good. S&P 500 opened up 930 Eastern Standard Time. And it was uh, quite a jump and everybody was happy and ecstatic. And of course, you know, as the markets go, 
the exuberance kind of wanes, people take profits or whatever happens. And uh, now we're still on the green looking pretty good. And the crypto market itself, yes, this is great today. And I don't, I can't say that I have a crystal ball and can tell you exactly where things are going. But I want to remind you that the reason why the markets dipped in the last couple of days, first of all, was uh, the longshoremen uh, for uh, in, in the harbors for their potential strike, which looks like it's already been averted in a, in a record of three days. And then, of course, there was uh, unrest in the Middle East with uh, a missile strike to Israel. So you put all those things together and there was just uncertainty and there was a big drop off. But the markets themselves, they were pricing in 50 basis point cuts. And we got that last month. And now if we take a look at the FedWatch tool, right now the current target rate is 475 to 500. And what they're saying is that, and this, was, this wasn't even a thing. This was like maybe 2%, 3% in the last hour or so, it's jumped up to 5%. And I will remind everybody that just because the, we have these percentages, if you keep watching this Fed tool, you'll see just how erratic it actually is. Look at these numbers over here. The target range, for 450 to 475 uh, one month ago was 49%. And now we're looking at 95%. And the 475 to 500, it was 30% just roughly a month ago. And now we're looking at 5%. So we'll see how it works, but I expect, I mean, who knows? I mean, the, Jerome Powell could come out next month in November, or excuse me, yeah, 7th November, because there is no cut this month. It's, it's, it's for November. Jerome Powell could just easily come out to come out next month and say, you know what? When well, the data comes in, and it looks like we're not going to have any uh, rate cuts. And if that happens, then the markets will respond, and it'll probably drop down because, you know, oh, it's awful. And uh, you'll have another stagnant market for quite some time. I've always said that I don't think we're going to get anywhere until after this presidential election. So today's a good day. I mean, chalk it up for what it is. I'm happy to. I mean, great. 24 hours, 3.3. But we've been range bound forever in the 62K mark. So I don't see it as like, this is the great be end all be all. I still say that things are going to happen uh, later in the year, towards the end of the year, and then 2025. But for this, it's just an accumulation phase for me. So let me know what you think about that in the comment section. Also, there is some good news as well in the uh, macro environment. Looks like the uh, port strike. The longshoremen, uh, looks like they just struck a deal. Again, three days, amazing how that works out. So this is what we have. And again, when you have stuff like this, it, it calms the market's jitters. Here's what happened. The two sides agreed to a 62% wage increase over six years. Reasonable, I suppose. Union had been seeking a 77% increase over six years. A day before the strike began, the companies offered 50. So again, you know, Go into the negotiating table. We'll give you 50. We want 77. Okay, meet in the middle, 62. And then done. Parties have also agreed to extend the existing contract until January 15th, which of next year. They will return to the bargaining table to negotiate all their outstanding issues, including the union's demand of a ban on all automation at the port. So we'll see how that works out. But again, I just want to bring this up to everybody because when this story came out, like I was following, I'm like, oh, that's interesting. We'll see what happens. And of course, the court could be absolutely horrible uh, as far as the distribution and uh, getting in supplies. And what happens? They cut a deal. And then everything goes back to essentially normal until you know early next year to see what actually happens. But people will freak out in the markets and they will sell everything. It's like, oh, well, this is going to happen. And then we're going to you know have this big tidal wave. It's going to mess up with, with the total economy. And we're not going to get all of these 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 items in, and it's going to be just totally awful. So I got to get out of the market now. Today it's totally different. So like just like we talked about a couple of days ago, deal with the things that you can control and the things that are outside your control. Just let them pass. So in this situation, great. All you had to do is absolutely do nothing, and you're right back where you are. Actually, you're way, actually way ahead. So congratulations if you did nothing or even bought the dip. So there is that piece, and then also. So I wanted to bring up a couple of pieces of information, which was uh, we were talking about Ethereum on NFA Live uh, yesterday, yesterday morning, as a matter of fact. And 
one of the things that we brought up or Ben's question was, do you think Ethereum is just an old relic and it won't really do too much? And, you know, we went back and forth, but I said, look, I go, Ethereum, I mean, it is an older crypto. It's been around for quite some time. And I said, I said, yeah, it's, it's not as fast as other chains. It has slower TPSs. It's very expensive compared to like other layer ones. But I said, you know, there is one thing about it. That is that it's battle tested. And for traditional markets, they look at that and go, you know what? We're not going to risk trillions of dollars on some chain that sometimes will just go down. Uh, we'd like to see where these are going and, and we'll use this one. Now, that's not to say other chains won't be used, but this was a report that came out that Visa launched uh, launches their tokenization platform. So payment giant Visa announced its plan to launch a stable coin tokenization platform launched next year. Again, like I've always said, I don't think anything's going to happen until 2025, end of the year, maybe. And that's it. Platform will enable banks to mint, burn, and transfer fiat currency backed tokens. Let me say that again. The platform by Visa choose, chose Ethereum, enable banks to mint, burn, and transfer. I know you right now are probably saying to yourself, who cares? I don't care. I, I don't like my bank. That's true. And you may not like your bank. I actually personally do like, I have USAA. It's a great bank. Horrible on payments, but whatever. But if you have something like, like this and Visa is partnering up with the banks, what does that mean for Ethereum? Well, if Ethereum's on the rails, maybe that's something to uh, take a look into and maybe diversify in your portfolio. I'm just saying, as they partner with banks and Visa, does this tokenization platform. And also on top of that, you have to remember this, PayPal, which chose two chains to build their PayPal USD stablecoin. And those two chains are Ethereum and Solana. Now, I don't know why they chose, uh, chose uh, uh, Ethereum for that. It's, you know, as far as layer one, I'm guessing it's a layer two because I mean, that seems kind of ridiculously high for payments. But if you're thinking to yourself, like, which one's going to make it? Sometimes you don't have to even have to worry about the different projects that are coming out. Maybe you just get into layer one. But this is what happened. PayPal, Ernst & Young, settled the first corporate payment via PYUSD stablecoin. And just to be clear, uh, Tether still owns the lion's share of stable coins, but PayPal is trying to make a dent, so we'll see if it works. So the transaction was a way to demonstrate how corporations could use stable coins to make instant payments. Robin Hood, eh, Robin Hood, you know, that equities trading platform. And Revolut, also a bank, a neobank, are reportedly considering launching their own stable coins in some jurisdictions. Which layer one do you think they're going to use? Tether's USDT largely dominated the stablecoin market. At the time of writing, USDT has a market cap of 119 billion. It's a lot. Again, lion's share. USD coin or USDC has 35 billion market cap, and PayPal USD has pretty much not really that much. But they're trying to to break into it. So I'm bringing this up to you not because I own a bunch of Ethereum. I really don't. But if you take a look at where things are going, I mean, I own Ethereum, but it's not like the massive, massive, like second, second piece of my, of my uh, portfolio. I just want to bring it to people's attention because I think that paper or Ethereum gets kind of a bad rap. And I see like behind the scenes where people and big institutions are going. Now you can go the other way and say, well, I'll wait for the other people to come in, but I'm just talking about what's going on now. Who has the partnerships? Who's making all these things for layer ones? And it looks like, I mean, Ethereum is doing a pretty good job and it's not as dead as people would report. So let me know what you think about that in the comment section. And then lastly, just to uh, end up, we did a video with Beardy and it was pretty great. It was, uh, it was tough for him to talk about, but he lost his, uh, essentially his life savings on an AI scam. And I read the comments and they were pretty brutal, but that's just normal. You know, some people just, that's just how people are, right? I don't know. I don't know what they're going through in their lives to leave these comments, but I just want to remind everybody that scams, uh, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when you're going to get scammed. And uh, I know people say, well, I will never get scammed because of XYZ. Trust me. I get emails weekly by people who say the same thing. I've been in the market for blah, blah, blah. I never thought it would happen to me. And then all of a sudden I was distracted and I got, I lost this and this and this. It happens. This is a, a great piece from uh, Scam Sniffer Web3 Anti-Scam. In September alone, September, 
10,000 victims lost almost $50 million to crypto phishing scams. I don't know about you, but I thought that meme coin traders, uh, some of them did pretty good, but apparently not. It's the scammers that make all the money. In Q3, in Q3, phishing losses total 127 million with an average of 11,000 victims per month. Two major victims accounted for 87 million. So just so you know that as time goes on, again, Try to minimize what you get scammed out of. It's not how much you make, it's how much you keep. Like we always talk about, don't get too upset. Try to follow the rules that I have over here. Everything's a scam and it's all proven otherwise. And uh, hopefully it works out for you. So that's it for today. Just want to bring those items to your attention. And then, uh, oh yeah, yeah, last uh, couple of PSAs, which was if you have World Mobile Token, remember you have until the 21st of October to swap them out. If you are staking it, you have until, I would wait until after the 9th when you get your staking rewards and kind of go from there. Also, if you're looking for discounts on different uh, crypto projects that are out there, follow us at uh, Velos Finance. This is a project that I'm involved with. There's a link in the description. You can figure it all out and go from there. But that's it for today. So look, like today's video, give it a thumbs up, consider subscribing. When we talk about is uh, time sensitive, but that is it for that piece. Now let's do a little quick Q&A. And I'll answer all your questions to the best of my abilities, and we'll go from there. But if you got to take off, take off. Appreciate you guys stopping by. And that's it for this one.